Good evening. My name is Allison Pergel, and I am the lead librarian at the Norton Shores branch of the Muskegon Area District Library. It is my very great pleasure to welcome you tonight as the library welcomes and remembers World War II by discussing the Ghost Mountain Boys and the Forgotten War of the South Pacific. Thank you for taking the time to join us this evening. Before we begin, the Muskegon Area District Library would like to gratefully thank our co-sponsors whose support makes this event possible. The USS LST 393 Veterans Museum, the USS Silverside Submarine Museum, and the Almeda Bolton Fund of the Community Foundation for Muskegon County. Before we begin, I did wanna take a moment to explain a few details for tonight's program. We will be running a live question and answer session at the end of the presentation. Please feel free to type in a question you may have in the chat box that should be near the bottom of your screen. And we will try and get in as many questions as time allows at the end of the presentation. If typing isn't your thing, when the question and answer session starts, you can also use the raise your hand feature also near the bottom of your screen and you will be unmuted to ask your question. And if you miss anything tonight, don't worry. A recording of tonight's event will be posted on Maddle's YouTube channel by Monday, November 30th. I would now like to turn the program over to this evening's moderator, Muskegon Community College instructor, George Maniatis, along with our guest author, James Campbell. Thank you, take it away, George. Well, thank you, Allison. It's so nice to be with you tonight. And I really wanna thank the Muskegon Area District Library for keeping the, the flames of knowledge going during this trying time. Just when we think we're out of the woods, here comes another shutdown or rest period. And we're all kind of reeling with uh, a new reality. Maybe we're gonna have Thanksgiving in the driveway under a tent or something, or 22 feet apart, we'll be passing the turkey with a uh, stick or something. Well, tonight I'd like to, to carry on with the thoughts that you initially shared. Uh, you should all be seeing my screen at this time. We wanna thank our sponsors, of course, our local museums, the USS Silversides and the LST 393 Museum. As many of you are aware of, Muskegon was one of the five arsenals of democracy during World War II. Our industrial capacity was incredible and our contributions to the war effort made a big deal, big, big deal. And it made a big change in the way that we were able to fight the war and be successful. And we have to uh, take our hat off to the people of Western Michigan because we are heroes in many ways. And we're gonna be talking about some of that tonight. I am pleased to be bringing to you tonight, James Campbell, who's written the book, The Ghost Mountain Boys. Uh, this book is incredible. It's written in commemoration of the 32, 32nd Red Arrow Division, Infantry Division, which was composed of men from Western Michigan, Wisconsin, and the Midwest who shipped off, initially it was mustered as a National Guard unit, was shipped off to, um, to Australia to fight eventually in Papua New Guinea. Now I'm gonna cut away now to one of our sponsors, uh, Ms. Peggy Maniatis, who's gonna be talking about the USS Silversides Museum uh, in, a, in a way, a brief way. Thank you very much. Um, the USS, <clears throat> excuse me, the USS Silversides is very proud to sponsor tonight's program. The mission of the USS Silversides Summary Museum is to honor the American veteran. And we do this every day through education and preservation. Everyone is very familiar with how we preserve our vessels and the artifacts of the museum, but we also offer 25 lectures a year on military history. It's so exciting to see this topic brought up again. We've hosted this wonderful speaker at the museum several times. And if any of you are interested in learning more about the lecture series that we have at the museum, please go to our website, www.silversidesmuseum.org, or to be put on the mailing list, please give the museum a call and we'll gladly put you on our mailing list. We have a new lecture series that'll be starting in third Monday in February. And it'll be the American military experience post Vietnam to the fall of the wall. 
and it should pose to be a very exciting time for us. And we'll have 10 lectures covering that modern American military history. And thank you to the Muskegon Area District Library and to all of the presenters this evening because it's absolutely wonderful when we can actually honor our veterans. Oftentimes it's so difficult to honor and understand someone that we have no idea what it is that they've done for us. And through these type of lectures, their service becomes knowledge to all of us and we can better appreciate everything they've done. So thank you everyone for coming out this evening and we hope to see more of you at different lectures throughout the year. Thank you. All righty, thank you, Ms. Penley Maniatis. Now, uh, I wanna just talk very briefly. The LST 393 Museum is located at the BART Dock, which is right across from the brand new Civic Center that is being constructed downtown. The LST stands for the landing ship troop uh, tank. It was a vessel that was used on D-Day to transport troops and tanks on the second day of D-Day onto the shores of Normandy. The mission of the LST 393 is to provide a living history of the US veteran experience. And we cover everything from World War II to the present so they are open seasonally. They will reopen again in April and they run through approximately Labor Day. So um, please feel free to join us. Um, it is part of our living legacy. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight our author. Our author is James Campbell. James was born, raised in, in Wisconsin. He's almost like a brother from a different mother to me in some respects because a lot of his trajectory, his, his education, his interests are kind of some of the things I'm interested in. And he's a prolific writer. He's written a number of books, of course, the Ghost Mountain Boys being one of them, but he's also written a lot of books on the outdoors and the outdoor experience, The Final Frontiersman, which is uh, later on, it's going to be part, it was part of a reality TV show, The Last Alaskans. Um, and um, it was a, a, a preview of a, a cousin of his, Heimel Korth, who lived 250 miles north of the last road in northern Alaska, up in the Arctic Circle. Um, he also wrote a book, The Color of War, which chronicled the experiences of African-American troops in World War II that were loading ships, naval ships, with munitions and a tragedy that broke out there that really cost a number of lives and the subsequent inquest that went on after those troops refused to load those dangerous ships, which brought uh, a, a Thorogood Marshall into play. James has written also another book, which is kind of interesting, Braving It, and I'll have him talk about that uh, just in a second. But he's written for a number of magazines, Outside Magazine, National Geographic Adventure, Men's Journal, uh, Audubon Magazine. If you're ever lost in the woods, you hope that you have James Campbell with you because he has the experience and the knowledge and definitely knows what he's doing. Welcome, James. Uh, thank you very much, George. I appreciate the very, very kind introduction, particularly for my lost brother. Okay, and I'm, and I'm George Maniatis, and I'm a history instructor at Muskegon Community College. I run the Center for Experiential Learning. Some of you I may know, you might be some of my students, some of you have met me in the community at some of our lectures. Uh, we've been doing this sort of activity for a long time, and I want to thank Allison for extending this to us tonight. So James, it's been great. I'm gonna, if you don't mind, James, can I just show a little bit of the background of this before we get started with our questions? Oh, I wish you would, that's okay. great. All right, so I'm gonna show a little video here. It's gonna be a little bit less than 10 minutes, but it's gonna set the, the, um, set the scene for us tonight in terms of uh, our uh, historical background of this particular so thing. So. Let me share my screen again with you all, and we're going to take this away. Set the stage for tonight's program. In order to get a better historical context of what we're going to be covering with our Ghost Mountain Boys presentation, I think it's important that we look at the following question. 
how did a unit from Western Michigan, Wisconsin, start a Pacific theater comeback for the United States? What qualities did these young men have that constituted the world's greatest generation? What was the condition of Australia in 1942? How difficult was a campaign in Papua New Guinea? And how ferocious was this enemy, the Japanese, in 1942? So, with these things in consideration, we have to understand the enemy, Japan. And Japan is more than just an enemy with a rising sun flag. It was a full-fledged military power to be reckoned with. A power that had risen over a 70-year period from the Meiji Restoration, where Japan went from feudalism essentially into the modern world in a 70-year period to a point where it was a uh, force invading China and committing all sorts of ferocious war atrocities. One of the things that we have to understand about this particular nation, the Japanese had transformed themselves with the aid of rapid industrialization and military modernization into a formable force, both on the sea with a huge navy, which probably rivaled no one else in the, the Pacific, and also with a up and coming army, which had a high level of bravery and chivalry as part of their tradition. And uh, we have to understand this because in 1904 and 1905, they took on the largest competitor in Asia, the Russians, and defeated them both on the seas and by land to start their, their process of conquest in Asia. Nonetheless, after settling their war with Russia at the request of Theodore Roosevelt, who hosted the Portsmouth Peace Treaty talks in 1905, Japan was part of the World War I effort in the Pacific. And they had supported Great Britain by uh, accompanying British ships and protecting them, and also leading battles against the German possessions in China. And they were highly successful at that. When they came to the, the, the Paris peace talks, uh, which ultimately led to the Treaty of Versailles, in 1920, the Japanese were treated as second class citizens. And you can see from the picture here, we have the Japanese delegation of diplomats that appeared at the Paris peace conference in 1919. And Clearly, the Western powers, namely the British, were very concerned by the rising Japanese fleet and the military prowess and might of Japan. So much so that by 1923, they had broke off alliances with Japan. And much of this was to do based on a racial component, of course, the Japanese being Asians and being tenacious fighters where it's really shaking up the whole world of social Darwinism, which had pretty much thought that white Anglo-Saxon Protestants were going to rule the world. Well, that was being tossed on its head in Asia with the rising of the, China, the Japanese. And Japan began to, to focus its efforts, particularly at this time, on things that were uh, of interest to them. Now, after 1905, they had taken Korea as a colony and they began to set sights on Manchuria. Now we have to remember that Japan is a resource starved nation. So in 1931, September 1931, they took over a great swath of Manchuria and set up a puppet government, puppet Chinese government beholden to the Japanese called Manchukuo. 
getting, of course, raw materials from Manchuria that would be essential for Japan's war effort in the future. Then in 1937, with escalating hostilities, Japan declared war on China, invaded Shanghai, and also took Nanking, the capital of China at the time. The sacking of Nanking, the capture of Nanking, resulted in one of the most cruelest and barbaric acts of World War II. As I said, World War II, because the Sino-Japanese War could be, be, by extension, the beginnings of World War II. And it resulted in the deaths of 250,000 Japanese, or Chinese, excuse me, civilians, many by beheadings, rapes, and mass executions. The world was scandalized by photos, newsreels, and others taken by Westerners who lived in Nanking and who published these things out on in the Western press and on the screens of Western theaters. Americans, Europeans, and others were highly offended and angered by what they saw, so much so that there was campaigns to start to isolate and segregate Japan in the world. So resulted in the United States beginning to do things like an embargo act where they started to uh, freeze the material, scrap steel, oil, and other materials that Japan would need to uh, fuel its war machine. As supply began to uh, wither, the Japanese began to plan for the next step in their operation in world conquest. And this resulted in the sneak attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. Pearl Harbor being the U.S. Pacific Fleet base, uh, the destroying of many U.S. warships would uh, render a crippling blow to the U.S. fleet in its support of its Pacific efforts, especially its bases that they had in the Philippine Islands. On the same timeline, it was a coordinated Z-Day type attack where Japan launched offensives uh, uh, in combination on the Philippine Islands, Hong Kong, Borneo, the Dutch Indies, attempting to, to mute the Western presence of the English, the Dutch, and the USA in Asia. The Philippine Islands, under the command of General MacArthur, found themselves cut off and also not liable to be able to receive more troops or supplies. And against this backdrop, by March of 1942, the word goes out from uh, Theodore Ro uh, Franklin Roosevelt that General Douglas MacArthur, the leading U.S. general, is to be taken out of the Philippines and uh, sent to Australia. And at this point, we will start our story today. Um, about the Ghost Mountain Boys and what had what precipitated in this chapter of U.S. history, because how did boys, men, the world's greatest generation of soldiers start this comeback for the United States? So this is where the world stood at the time of 1942. This is the extent that Japan had taken uh, territory. It's looking very grim for Australia, and our story is going to focus on this island, Papua New Guinea, one of the uh, largest islands in the world. Uh, we're going to be able to see how U.S. troops conducted this unbelievable campaign uh, through some of the roughest territory known to man to dislodge the Japanese. So we'll take it from there. Okay, James. So let's take it from there. How okay, did, nice introduction. How did you become acquainted with this story? This isn't like something that's written in every military history book. <laughs> oh, that's really long story. So I'll keep it as painlessly brief as I can. Um, in 
my brother and I grew up on National Geographic documentaries. And in 1989, he graduated from college and I had a, a respectable job. And we'd always thought about doing, you know, taking a young man's adventure. And we decided um, based on those National Geographic documentaries that we were either gonna build a raft and float down the Amazon or we were gonna go to deepest, darkest New Guinea. And we chose to go to New Guinea. And we were there for a bunch of months. We climbed all the highest mountains. We trekked through jungles. And it was just a, a wonderful young man's adventure. But prior to that, I'd never, ever heard about the, the war. I, I knew about the war in the Southwest Pacific, but I knew nothing about the battle for New Guinea. And um, I, met a, I met some missionaries there and some anthropologists and some historians who told me about this battle. And then I came and they said, by the way, they were probably fought by men from your, you know, your state, your, or at least your region. And I came home and it turns out that um, a, a, a man that I knew who lived three, three doors down from us had fought in New Guinea and had never uttered a word about it. And, um, and he had been a friend of the family for years. So I felt, I felt, I guess, a responsibility and, a, and maybe a, a certain level of shame for not having known about, um, not having known about the battle in New Guinea and the, not having known about the battle that the men I'd watched in parades and the men I'd grown up around had fought. So I started just very casually doing research about, about the battle or about the very variety of battles on the island of New Guinea. And then in 1995, I did um, the most improbable thing of all from the, certainly from the perspective of the, of the veterans who had fought there. Um, my wife and I, my wife and I got married and I wanted her to see New Guinea. So we traveled, we did some, some easy traveling in New Zealand and Australia. And then we went to New Guinea and we spent six weeks in New Guinea and my wife got malaria and she suffered mightily. And I eventually got her out to a little island off the North coast of New Guinea called Ternate. But it was on that trip for the first time that I learned about the trek of the Ghost Mountain Boys. And at that point I was riveted. Um, I was writing for a variety of magazines and I'd hoped to be an author one day, an author of a book. And I realized that this was a, a wonderful book idea. Nobody had, nobody had written that history. So I slowly started meeting people across the Midwest, primarily in Wisconsin. And then in the early 2000, I attended a um, 32nd Division Old Timers meeting at Fort McCoy in Wisconsin. And I, I was in the barracks with these guys. I listened to their polka music. I listened to their bad jokes and I drank beer with them. And they referred me to friends. And then ultimately I came to Russell Byes, who um, uh, was, was a resident of Muskegon. And he very generously offered to um, have a bunch of the members of Company G meet at his house. And then I met men that I would later call friends. I met Stanley Yastrzemski and Carl Stenberg and Don Ritter and Don Stout. And I forget all the names, but it was, it was one of the greatest experiences of my life meeting those men. Yeah, and clearly I, I met some of them a few years ago when you spoke the first time. And, you and know, they unbelievable, were able to make it. unbelievable guys, humble men, but nonetheless, yes. part of this idea of the world's greatest generation. So what constitutes that, Jim, in, in your mind, the world's greatest generation? What made these guys the type of soldiers that we can admire today? What was their I, I want to answer that question, but I want to just tell one story. Um, Stanley Yastrzemski used to, used to call our, 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 our house back when we all had answering machines. And I still have a recording of, of one of his calls. And he used to call up and say, this is Stan the Man Yastrzemski. And he'd say, J-A-S-T-R-Z-E-M-B-S-K-I is how you spell it. Please call me back. <laughs> and he, well, he was a wonderful guy, as many of us know. But um, what constituted the greatest generation? You know, 
I really, I, I don't know if I can answer that. I think that obviously every generation is exemplary um, or has exemplary characteristics. Um, but I think that the, the greatest generation was different in that they, they were products of the depression. So they knew what hardship was. They knew what deprivation was. They knew what living without meant. And I think that, um, so they, I, I think were um, in some ways, in some ways prepared for, for, for war or for um, the, the deprivations of war. But I think that the National Guard system also, because particularly in the Midwest, a lot of these men came from small towns. They'd grown up together. They'd gone to school together. Then they went into the National Guard together. And the, the intensity of those friendships, I don't think can be, um, I, I don't think it can be overestimated. I think that they, it was, it was more than patriotism because I don't think an 18 year old young man or boy even you know, thinks about the nation, but what he does think about is he thinks about his his friends or his brothers by that, you know, by that time. And I think that loyalty to um, their fellow, their fellow guardsmen, um, uh, you know, prepared them to, to fight and, and to die. You know, they were, they were going to fight and die for, uh, for the, for the, you know, the people that they called friends and brothers. So and I think that they was particularly let, let down their buddies. Obviously, that's they, right. Well, they and, were and there I think for that, their comrades, their their best yeah. friends. Yeah, and it was they didn't want to let them down. But I think there was a real kind of love. I think there was a real bond between between those men that um, that uh, you know we we don't really maybe we don't really recognize or have today. And, and a lot of them came from a pretty hard scrambled background. You say Stan Yaroslavsky, but a lot of these guys are living, you know, what we would call in poverty, correct? To, by today's oh, standards. Oh yeah, you know, some of them didn't, you know, some of them didn't know where the next meal would come from. And, or, you know, they, they grew gardens, you know, they, they hunted because they had to hunt. They fished because they had to fish. And, and they were no strangers to hard work, obviously. Um, and, and, and in that way, I think they were a very, um, a very kind of different and uh, a very different generation. Yeah, very resourceful. Yeah. So th these guys got together, they were, a most of them were in the National Guard together here locally in, you know, the armories in, the, in Western Michigan, et cetera. But um, from that experience, how did they get whipped into this fighting force? You know, National Guard, and I'm not trying to poke fun at the Guard, and I'm not trying to demean anybody's service because I honor people, you know, that have served. I think that's quite the, the sacrifice. But, you know, that's not the special forces, is it? No, no. And, well, they, they, they weren't um, a trained fighting force. Um, you know, they were sent down to Louisiana um, to a, initially a place called Camp Beauregard, where, which they called Camp Disregard. And they trained with broom handles for rifles. And they did a lot of marching and they did a lot of yelling. And uh, then they tra transferred to Camp Livingston, which wasn't much, much better. And then in the late summer of 1941, they participated in something called the Louisiana Maneuvers, which was the largest peacetime war games in US history. 400,000 men participated in it in Louisiana and in East Texas. Although what they, what they learned was modern mechanized mobile warfare. They did not learn jungle fighting skills or jungle tactics. In fact, one of my characters, Major Herbert Stuttering Smith, who was one of the men who, who, who crossed the, the Owen Stanley Mountains said in one of his diaries, he said, the swamps of Louisiana were so available 
if only we had trained in them and if only we had known. So what he was referring to is, of course, if only they had known that they were going to be sent to New Guinea. But of course, they weren't. We had a Germany first policy. And initially, they were going to be sent to Germany. Then after they, they eventually were sent to Fort Devens, Massachusetts, and they were pre pre preparing to go to Europe, their engineering unit was sent over. And then they were sent to California, eventually put on ships and sent to Adelaide, Australia, where they were supposed to begin their kind of jumble, jungle combat um, training. But Adelaide, Australia, if, I don't know if you've ever been there. Oh, but, I haven't, but I can only imagine it wasn't yeah. Papua New Guinea. It's a cold place. So, so they weren't training for the jungle there. And then they eventually they made it to Brisbane, where the climate is a bit more similar. But they went to a place called Camp Tambourine, where they, um, they were supposed to begin their jungle training. And they were literally cutting down trees and digging latrines. So all they'd really done was a whole lot of marching. And then eventually in September, when some of the units were called up and sent to New Guinea, um, they, they were completely and thoroughly untrained and unprepared for this experience. And they were called the, uh, the guinea pigs of the South Pacific with very, very good reason. They were sent to one of the most malarial places on earth it, with a shortage of chloroquine. They had no idea um, about the topography. Uh, in New Guinea, we, we often think of Louisiana or maybe Seattle as rainy cities, and I think they get 70 inches of rain a year. In New Guinea, they get 200 inches of rain a year. So mm -hmm. they, they were completely unprepared for this experience. Um, and, and they suffered, and they suffered terribly. Yeah, I can only imagine um, being set into a place where you're underprepared um, and told to march across a mountain range from, from jungle to the, a 10,000 foot mountain range. Now, obviously, why did they end up in Australia? Boys from Wisconsin and, and Michigan, and why, why are they there? That doesn't seem like a good fit. Why, why did they get the short straw? Well, the Australians were 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 fighting overseas and um eventually macarthur um called up two brigades of the australian infantry that had been fighting in the middle east to stop the japanese attack on um the allied base of port moresby but as i said the 32nd division was supposed to be going to the european front um they had no notion that they were going to be sent to New Guinea. And their general, General Ed, Edwin Forrest Harding, who um, essentially wrote the book on modern battle tactics, the, edited the infantry journal at, um, at Fort Benning, you know, who was in charge of these men, said they're unprepared and told, told MacArthur, you can't send these men to New Guinea because they'll be slaughtered. They are, they're just not ready for it. But MacArthur was desperate, um, and it was a, as you know, in the book, I kind of come down, well, I come down pretty hard on MacArthur in his um, haughtiness and his pretentiousness, but he was sentenced to this backwater theater of New Guinea, and he was racing the Marines who were at Guadalcanal for the first, the first victory of the South Pacific. So he called up the 32nd, and Sent, sent them to Papua New Guinea and one of the first units sent over there was Company E out of Big Rapids, Michigan. And Sergeant Paul Luchens, I had his diaries. He wrote in his diary, September 15th, 5.30 p.m., temperature 115 degrees, New Guinea weather is hotter than the lower story of hell. Oh God. <laughs> so from 115 degrees in the jungles, they yeah. proceed up the Kappa Kappa Trail to get over the mountains. And th can you describe this trail? You know, is this a roadway? What is this thing that they're going across? You, you it, know, it was a goat trail. If um, the trail is no no 
bigger in most places than kind of a deer trail through the woods. Um, the Australians were for fighting. Well, MacArthur's initial idea, I'll just get back to strategy, was to send, there's a place called the Kokoda Trail, which is north of the Kappa Kappa Trail by about 50 miles. And it was an old mail route. Um, Papua New Guinea was an Australian colony since 1906. And MacArthur's plan before the Japanese beat him to the punch and landed on New Guinea was to send was to send Australian American engineers over the mountains on the Kokoda track and then send most of our forces around the Papuan Peninsula, which is the tail that hangs down above Australia, um, and, then, and then to a place called Buna. But the majority of the troops, 95% of them, were gonna come, were gonna come by water. Um, and that was that was called Operation Providence, but um, that didn't last very long because the Japanese essentially beat us to the punch. But what these what these men encountered was um, suffering on a on a on a level that we can't imagine. MacArthur's chief engineering unit officer said, "U.S. forces would encounter circumstances." On the island on the island of New Guinea, without precedent in American military history, and that's exactly what happened. And the Australian Australians who'd been in New Guinea, as I said, since 1906, knew what they were talking about, and he they told MacArthur, "The trail is too rugged, the mountains are too high, and the rivers are too fast. Don't do it." Well, MacArthur sent eventually 1300 men over those mountains and other men over other various other mountains and they suffered mightily they 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 were there during the rainy season so they were walking in mud up to their ankles soon up to the tops of their shins um, they were exposed to malaria on the coast and then malaria was reproducing inside their systems so three weeks in, the men started developing fevers. So they were hiking with 101, 102, 103 degree fevers. Then, then dysentery hit. So in when that when that when that hit, the, the, the force was nearly crippled. And eventually they did make it to Buna. They made it to the north coast, and many of the men had lost a third of their body weight before they even went into battle. So they are fighting sick. They have to attack the Japanese at Buna. What is the total distance they had to transverse over these mountains and through the jungles? 130 miles. And 130 miles of the most unforgiving, formidable terrain, and without exaggeration, on the planet Earth, um, through swamps and through jungles, and over mountains, for every thousand, for every thousand feet you gain, you lose six hundred feet going down, and then you climb back up. It took them, it took them a day to cover three miles, oh. and they, and they started developing, as I said, in addition to malaria and dysentery, trench foot and jungle rot and jungle ulcers, and. Um, in, in this was before they even began to fight. Yeah, and how long did this take them to do? How many days were they on this? Uh, it took them 42 days. 42 days to go 130 miles. miles. 130 miles, wow, yep. unbelievable. Now you have a little clip of your travels. You tried to replicate this. You went and you did replicate this. You followed the same trek. Can you show a couple minutes of that clip? Yeah, you know, I can I can try to do that. And and please, if it's a small screen, so if that screen if the screen doesn't work, just interrupt me and I can turn it off. Okay. Okay. Let's see if I can get this. Um, fortunately, I got an education in this just before we began. Because I think the crowd would like to see what you encountered. You yeah, see. Okay, let's see. <laughs> Uba 
chapter of World War II bravery and suffering. In 2006, the author and adventurer began an extraordinary quest to retrace the path of an American infantry battalion sent on an impossible mission. The soldiers were ordered to march 120 miles over the uncharted mountains of New Guinea. Their journey has been described as one of the cruelest in modern military history. Many of them National Guardsmen from the Midwest. They would endure an incredible test of survival before they even entered combat. Starting from their coastal camp, the soldiers slashed their way through the jungle to a 9,000-foot peak that the natives said was haunted. The soldiers called it Ghost Mountain, and they would become known as the Ghost Mountain Boys. Well, Ghost Mountain, we walked over to Ghost Mountain, there wasn't a bug, a fly, or nothing. There was no birds. It was just weird. It was eerie. And of course, the more burdens you got, the tired you got, well, you start shedding stuff. And I think when we went over to Ghost Mountain, is when I shed everything I had. And go to natives to go over it because I think they had, uh, they, they couldn't go, but just so far. Malaria, dysentery, jungle rot, trench foot, and hunger plagued them. And on the other side of the mountains, elite troops of the Japanese Empire waited in their bunkers. The battles on the beaches and in the swamps of New Guinea, sometimes fought hand to hand, were some of the most savage of the South Pacific War. That was 1942. More than a half century later, Campbell began assembling his right Ghost here, Mountain team. Ghost Mountain. Old friend and Chicago-based journalist George Hood agreed to take part, suggesting they collaborate on a documentary. Another friend, Dave Musgrave, a professor at the University of Alaska Fairbanks and an accomplished backpacker, also signed on. I can't imagine doing this, not knowing what's ahead, having dysentery, malaria, not having the right equipment. Outside magazine photographer Philip Engelhorn became the team's fourth member. Can I go home now? German by birth, Engelhorn was based in Hong Kong. I'm tired and I'm hungry. Palm Productions of New Guinea provided the camera crew. The trail boss was Lee Ticehurst, an Australian living in New Guinea and an experienced jungle trekker. All slingshots and spears and the dogs. The dogs are more important than anything else that you can hunt with. These dogs will not bark until they see the game. And then everybody knows it's on. On a hot June day from a high ridge overlooking the Mimoni River, Campbell and his team began their journey. That first day, the expedition nearly collapsed when Campbell fell and re-injured a knee. He was forced to turn back. Tired and dehydrated, Hood also retreated. We're feeling pretty exhausted. It's a tortuous country. Um, I'm 44 years old with a bad wheel. I uh, thought I could do it, and um, it's a killer. We get three days in, we start failing, then what the heck do we do? Plus, we didn't want to slow down the entire group. Rather humiliating, as you might imagine. The rest of the team went on. Back in Fort Moresby, Campbell and Hood regrouped. Four days later, they rejoined the team by helicopter, landing at a village called La Rooney. did not travel alone. As the American
American Army had done, the team hired carriers and guides from the villages along the route. Among them was Beirua. As a seven-year-old boy, too frightened to stay behind, Beirua followed his parents as they carried ammunition and supplies for the Americans. Now more than 70, he and his wife Bima would help guide Campbell and his team over Ghost Mountain. Beirua warned Campbell the mountain was haunted by Masalai, evil spirits and demons. Barua told other stories and helped the team find those who knew or remembered the American soldiers. Oh, Jesus, help me. Jesus, help me. The sword and plane press, and then they, they start, the troops were moving, the American troops will start moving down to where the plane crashed. Those tales have become part of the local folklore, passed down from generation to generation around village campfires. In 1942, the rugged interior of New Guinea was an unmapped wilderness. Sixty-four years later, the team would discover an ecosystem and native people largely unchanged by the passage of time. Well, that, I think, shows it all. You know, uh, I have never seen that sort of a rugged place ever before. And your experience going over that is to be, you know, commended, obviously. So these men marched 135 miles through godforsaken territory, sicker than dogs, to attack the Japanese Ibuna. Why is Japan so interested in Papua New Guinea? Why, what are they doing with this place, James? Well, from Papua New Guinea, the, the, well, first of all, they owned, they, they occupied with a greater co-prosperity fear, one-sixth, as you showed initially for, in your map, one-sixth of the Earth's surface. And New Guinea was one of the last essential pieces in their, you know, this colossal land grab of theirs. And from New Guinea, they hoped to use New Guinea to interrupt our 8,000 mile supply line. Had they been able to get New Guinea, had they been able to get Guadalcanal in the Solomons, um, there's nothing we could have done in the Southwest Pacific. The war, the war would have been over. Yes, yeah, so New Guinea was an essential piece of property. So the 32nd, not only do they have to win this battle because it is critical that they maintain Papua New Guinea so we can keep the supply lines open to keep right. submarine bases in, in Australia, which is our, our, essentially our naval force at that time because we cannot bring in destroyers and you know, large battleships. We only have four aircraft carriers that are left so we're, we're in tough shape. So we yeah. got to keep this at all costs. And of course, Australians were terrified. They, J Japan had already bombed, you know, much of Australia and had sent submarines as far south as, as Sydney. So the Australians were, were terrified. But yeah, it, it, MacArthur obviously left the Philippines and ignominy, but um, and was unhappy about essentially being sentenced to New Guinea. But um, there was no more important or important or pivotal, um, you know, piece of land in the entire world at that point. Now, clearly, men of the World War II generation usually don't open up and tell their stories. I had an uncle. I rarely knew anything about his exploits. The only time I ever heard was when he was with another relative of mine who served in the same theater of operation and they were at my father's funeral dinner and they started talking amongst each other. They had never yeah. met each other before. And then the story started coming out of their service 
And, uh, you know, it was funny. I didn't know that this one uncle was a bronze star winner until his funeral where his decorations were displayed. He never yeah. talked about this. So how did yeah. you get these guys to open up? Well, I, I think, you know, um, James Bradley said in his book, Flags of Our Fathers, he said, they came home and they got on with living. And I think that's that's absolutely true. So many of them, so many of them, I think, um, were so happy to leave that war behind. You know, they they buried their memories, and I think only later in life did many of them feel that it was time to time to tell their story. And um, I just happened to be you know, in, in maybe the right place at the right time. But I did, you know, I did, I researched this for, you know, for five years, researched and wrote it for five years. So I, I, I did develop, you know, lots of, lots of very close friendships. And I spent as much time with the men as I could. And I traveled all over the United States. As I said, I was at Fort McCoy with the guys you know, listening to their stories. And um, I did occasionally have the wife of a serviceman call me up and say, you know, I'd like you to stop talking with so-and-so about the war. He's having nightmares. You know, he can't, he can't sleep at night. And I said, that's the last thing in the world I want to do is, you know, is bring back that trauma for them and then they would call me up and that that you know the that world war ii veteran and say no i need to talk about this is you know in many ways in in many ways it's the first time i've ever talked about this in my life and i need to talk about it and um, that's their way to decompress the, to get rid of this post-traumatic stress disorder which we we talk about today or at least acknowledge that wasn't an option for World War II people, you know? No, that no, that wasn't. And I think particularly for the men who fought in New Guinea because it was so underpublicized. You know, the Marines um, got a lot of the credit, which they deserved. But um, the 32nd Red Arrow men in, in, in New Guinea who fought so ferociously, um, were, were 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 largely largely unrecognized by by the nation, and I think many of these men later in life wanted to tell realize that you know their days were numbered, and wanted to tell this story. Um, and you know, thank heavens for me that that they were you know gracious and generous enough, you know, to tell me their story. So what does it take to put a book like this together? Clearly, you know, we re I read the, a book like this. I am fascinated with your depth of research, your ability to tell a story, because that's what history is. His story, her story, making us equate with that personal individual, but putting it in a bigger contextual mode. What does it take to do this? You know, this is obviously an art form. Not any of us, you know, many of us can't even spin a sentence, let alone anything else. Oh, there were many times I got, I was in the midst of that book, George, and thought, I am never, ever, ever going to finish this book. Um, you know, it's just like any other job. You just, you know, inspiration rarely comes. You just have to be workmanlike about it. And you have to, you know, sit down every day and, you have to construct a ten sentence or a paragraph or or pages. But um, I was lucky in that um, a lot of the men I, sp I spoke with were also very natural storytellers. Um, and in New Guinea, I also had, um, you know, this 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 almost otherworldly place, you know, a place of um, of as I said, formidable topography, dramatic topography that, um, that, that I wanted to write about. And also I wanted to write about the people and their culture. And by the way, I should say that without the, the help of the Papua New Guineans um, who, who served as litter bearers, stretcher bearers, as scouts, 
as carriers, we might not have won that war. Um, and they, most of them sided with us instead of the Japanese, but um, they were essential to that victory. And neither um, the US nor Australia has ever formally thanked the Papua New Guineans for their contribution. Um, but the, the book, and as I said, you know, I'm kind of a boots on the ground author, you saw that. So I tore my knee, I tore, I tore my, the ACL in my knee um, a month and a half before the trek. And um, I should not, have, should not have been doing it, but I realized that I had one opportunity and only one opportunity. So I was there with a torn ACL, you know, trying to carry a pack. And, you know, I fell the first day and then came back four days later, but, um, and was able to, to complete the trek by, I don't know, maybe the grace of God, but um, that was very, very important. I figure if I, I figured that if I was going to be writing about these men who suffered so terribly, I had to at least experience some, something of what they experienced. Obviously I couldn't experience battle, but um, I did get malaria after I got home. Uh, fortunately, I didn't get it on the trail, uh, but after you know, 27 days of hiking, you know, we got to sleep under clean sheets and celebrate with beer. And the men that I wrote about went into battle. So um, thing I always say is that I'm in no way comparing what I did or what we did with what those men did. And how intense was that fighting once they got over that mountain and they encountered the Japanese? Because this wasn't uh, just any pushover group of Japanese soldiers, was it? was some of the most brutal fighting of the entire World War II experience. They were elitely trained Japanese Imperial Army forces. And when I mean elitely trained, military historians who've written about the Japanese training said they trained in tropical dystopias. So they were prepared for the terrain. They were prepared for for exhaustion. They were pre prepared for the lack of food. Um, and then what they had, because they beat us to the punch, because they landed on New Guinea before we did, there was an 11 mile front on the north coast of the Papuan Peninsula. And on that 11 mile, 11 mile front, the Japanese were able to build hundreds and hundreds of interconnected and reinforced bunkers. And we had nothing to take them out. We had no 105 millimeter howitzers. We had no tanks. We had no flamethrowers. We had no destroyers off the coast shelling their positions. So we had to resort to what they called civil war tactics, it, um, which essentially meant rushing those bunkers and tossing a grenade in and you know, hoping for the best. So we lost lots and lots of men. In what fact, there were more casual, casualties per percent, in percent of casualties per troops committed on uh, the island in New Guinea, I think, than any other battle of the South, well, Southwest Pacific. So the losses there were much greater than almost any other battle, Peter. Huge losses, 70%, 75%. Now that also includes, that also includes falciparum and, you know, vivax malaria yeah, um, in a variety of different diseases, but um, as well as combat, um, combat injuries. But yeah, the losses were huge and heavy. Whole companies were the size of platoons in the 126th Infantry Regiment, the Ghost Mountain Boys essentially ceased to exist um, after that battle. Ooh. Unbelievable unbelievable level of, of losses and what a commitment to be able to carry on the attack even despite all these challenges. And yeah, and the, 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 as I said, the, strategically, everything favored the Japanese, but as I said, MacArthur, MacArthur was um, determined to register the first victory of the Southwest Pacific and um, continued to call to accuse the general, General Ed, Edwin Forrest Harding of the 32nd Division and its troop of troops of cowardice 
he thought it would take all of a week or two weeks to essentially unseat the Japanese. And eventually he relieved um, Harding and put in Eichelberger. And then when Eichel, he sent Eichelberger to the front, he said, take Buna or don't come back alive. Um, so uh, yeah, MacArthur was um, not willing to wait. Yeah, tremendous ego. Uh, and uh, the more I read about him, the less I respect him over time. So. Yeah. So. I, I see we're I just, getting some questions, James, and maybe it's a good time for us to segue to our guests and some of our questions. And also, I'd like to do a little attendance and see if there's any um, people out there that are children of the Ghost Mountain Boys or grandchildren. So, Jackie, can you read us a few of the questions that may have come through the chat? Actually, I can, I can do that for you, George. Yeah, thank um, you. It looks like we have a question here from one of our attendees. How were these poorly trained, poorly equipped Midwesterners able to overcome these highly trained dug in Japanese regulars? Uh, with, with raw courage and um, perseverance, heavy casualties, and eventually, eventually um, they were able to Naval forces were able to deliver tanks and flamethrowers and 105 millimeter howitzers. Without those deliveries, um, I don't know what would have happened. But um, it was, as I said, MacArthur thought we'd be there for two weeks and we were there for two and a half months attacking this, what amounts to pretty um, narrow confined position. I actually have a, a question for you too, James, if that's okay. I, yeah. I wanted to say I thoroughly enjoyed the book. I mean, I read like a novel. It was just amazing. And one of the features I really appreciated was getting that Japanese point of view in a way where we got yeah. uh, some of the experiences that they were having at the exact same time. Can you talk a little bit about why you opted to choose that format or include that point of view? Yeah, I figured it was, I, I wanted to try to penetrate the Japanese psyche because I'd heard about their fighting spirit. I heard, of course, about the, the bonsai charges. And I think that initially you saw that they were filled with, with pride and um, certainty um, of, of their victory. And then you see that slowly deteriorate. And by the end of the battle, as much as we were suffering, they might have been suffering even more. They were, they were absolutely close to starvation. They were suffering from all the diseases that the Red Arrow men had. And um, what, what, what MacArthur eventually realizes he was, he needed to cut off their supplies, so he bombed Rabal, which was the south, which was the, their base in the South Pacific, in where they sent all the supplies from. But I thought it was really, really important to get into the Japanese mind, as I said. And fortunately, the National Archives had a lot of the journals of just ordinary fighting men, which I was able to discover and realize that I really, um, I couldn't, I couldn't. Um, I, I could not do that. Well, I thought it was a great move. I really yeah, enjoyed thank you. that. We have another um, question from uh, Kurt this evening. Mr. Campbell, to the young students watching tonight, please say a few words as to why historical events of 75 to 80 years ago are important today. <laughs> yeah. Well, as they say, we have to understand history. So at least the, well, good history and bad history, but particularly the horrible aspects of history. So, so, so we don't repeat it, but I think that it's important to know, um, you know, this, what these men did for our country. I think it's, we always hear about the greatest generation, but we have to put, we have to be able to put um, a face to this generation or, faces to this generation. We have to understand that 
in many cases, these men were just like us. You know, they had hopes and dreams. They didn't want to be fighting in New Guinea. You know, they wanted to, they wanted to be there in Muskegon, living a happy, you know, happy life with children, et cetera. But um, they, they, they participated and devoted themselves to a cause greater than themselves. And I think that, um, I think that uh, we all owe obviously them a debt of gratitude but we also, we all have, I think, a responsibility to our, our fellow citizens our, our, in, our, in, our, in, our, in our country at large. Interesting. Uh, another comment from Janice. First, she'd like to thank uh, both James and George for this program, it's enlightening and so interesting. And she adds that she's not a relative, but her dad's best friend was Art Edson. Uh, he was a Ghost yeah. Mountain boy. Just wondering if there was any news of him. Such a humble man. Yeah, he was a humble man. I had, I, I knew Art and met with him a couple times and had his diary. And um, he passed away. Oh, um, uh, let's see. I, you know, I don't, I don't know. I, actually, I didn't know. I knew his. I'm sorry. I knew his son. Um, I don't know when um, when he passed away, but he was a he was a a big part of my book. I want to remind our participants if there's any more questions, be sure to add them to your. Oh, I have someone raising their hand. Uh, Mark, I'm going to let you go ahead and talk. Ah. And can you un? Let me see if I can unmute you here. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. Uh -huh. Mark J A S T R Z M E S K I Stan Sun. Hello, Mark. How are you? I, I I'm just you'd fine, be sir. And uh, you know, on behalf of my dad, uh, there's nothing I can add to what you've already said today. You and George did a great job. Um, you 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 documented the story and. Uh, I just want to say what a what a what a wonderful fellow that you are, and your work will live on for for generations. And I'm I'm just so happy to to count you as my friend, and my dad was too. Thanks, Jim. Yeah. Well, you know, I feel the same. The the Strensky family was is a pretty pretty wonderful family that I had the privilege of of getting to know. Great. I was going to uh, ask you, James, when you were talking a little bit about how you got, obviously you've met a lot of the men and you had access to diaries and things. And uh, I wondered, was, were, what was most of the primary material, the diaries and things given to you by family? Or um, you mentioned going into the National Archives. Were there any other archives that were helpful? Yeah, the, the, the Wisconsin Veterans Museum, um, your um, the university right outside of Grand Rapids, Grand Valley State, um, and um, lots of other lots. Of course, as, as you said, the National Archives, and then lots of people. Um, how they how they came to know about my project, I'm not sure, but they offered to send diaries and papers, etc. And you probably um, remember Major Simon Warmanhoven. Um, from who, who, you know, wrote these beautiful letters to his wife. And um, he was an absolutely in, in, incredible man. And um, he, he I, I, the story is that I'd almost finished my book and I was going to give the book to my publisher when um, I, I can't remember exactly what happened, but um, Muriel Joldersma, who lived up in Traverse City, and Ann Holman, his his two daughters who lived in Spring, who lives in Spring Lake, offered to give me all of his letters, which you know obviously took a ton of courage. Yeah, that's amazing. I found those those uh, excerpts of from the men's letters and things. At points I was even crying. I mean, it was like, oh my gosh, it's just amazing. <laughs> yeah. Me too, obviously. Um, 
but you know that that for them for them to do that um, took an amazing amount of courage, and I immediately realized that um, he was he was an extraordinary man, and that I that I needed to build him into the book's narrative. So yeah, so there there were many many examples of 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 that happening and the, the, the generosity and selflessness of people um, and um, the generosity and selflessness of, of the men to tell me their stories um, and, and to confide in me and to trust me with their, with their stories. So that, you know, that, that, that was a huge part of it. Once again, attendees, if there's any more questions, be sure to use your raise your hand option or type it into the chat box. I thought it was interesting when you talked about, you know, MacArthur's uh, competitism to uh, be the first one to get a battle in. I mean, was that sort of a, it seems such an odd concept to have in, in, in a war. Yeah, particularly when you're, when you're general in charge of the division says that these men aren't prepared and you send them into battle. And then after evaluating the front, um, when, he, when he tells you that um, this victory is what they call the Leavenworth nightmare, um, the command in general um, staff college in Leavenworth had never seen a situation like this. Uh, a General Harding who wrote the modern infantry um, uh, techniques and strategy manual or edited it had never seen anything like this. And he, he told Mac General MacArthur that this was gonna take time, but MacArthur obviously was, was impatient for victory. And um, General Ed Edwin For Forrest Harding was eventually dismissed because he was too principled a man to send his men to be slaughtered. Fascinating. We actually have another hand up here. I'm going to allow uh, Mr. Oosterhart to talk. If you, um, here we go. Okay. Um, I was wondering after this battle of Papua New Guinea, did these men get redeployed somewhere else or were they sent home? Some of them were sent home. Many of them were sent to Australia to recuperate. And then they were sent back to New Guinea where they island, they called it the long way back, where they island up eventually to the Philippines. And by the end of the war, they, they, they were in battle for 654 days. And again, when, when General MacArthur wanted to pull them out of um, Australia, um, Major Simon Warman, Warmanhoven said that they weren't ready. He wanted to do it very quickly. He said, these guys are not recuperated from their malaria. They're not ready to go back into battle. So, but yes, many of them, many of them were sent back to New Guinea. Island hopped all the way up the coast and then eventually through the islands to the Philippines. Uh, Taylor F. would like to tell everybody he enjoyed this they enjoyed this lecture very much, and that's nice to hear. I totally agree. I think it's been fascinating. And then we have another question from uh, Emma. What kind of defense did the Ghost Mountain Boys set up when they made it to the front line? None. <laughs> they, the Japanese were embedded right along, right along the beach. So essentially it was, it was a war it was a war of elimination. Um, there, there was there was no defense. They they killed as many Japanese as they could, and they were defending no position. They ultimately they ultimately seized Buna and two of the villages north of Buna, but um, at that point there were no more Japanese to fight, and the Japanese the Japanese uh, casualties were. Horrific. I thought it was interesting in the book when you uh, talked 
about a how young some of the men were, basically boys who got in because when they in, into the National Guard because people looked the other way. And I also thought it was interesting about those who really like were were quite not quite at weight or whatever, you know, trying to get themselves in the physical condition. <laughs> because my yeah. father was in World War was a was a World War II veteran, well, was a World War II veteran, but he was six foot two and weighed one eighteen. They never sent him over because. <laughs> yeah, uh, right. Right. Too thin, but he got in charge of a POW camp here. But well, and when you look at uniforms from that period of time, you often look at the pants sizes. They wouldn't fit around a guy's leg today. <laughs> Not two. You well, know, size 28, 30 waist. People don't wear those anymore. Yeah, well, J Jim Boyce, who, who did the reconnoiter trip on the Ghost Mountain Trail out of Swayze, Indiana, was a tiny man and never thought that he would make it into the service because he was so small. Yep, it, it's, it's kind of interesting. Uh, we do have a question here from Alex. Mr. Campbell, are you familiar at all with the unique tribal pop art that the American troops inadvertently inspired among the Na native Papua New Guinean tribes? Well, I'm sitting here in my office. I'm surrounded by New Guinea art and um, and red arrow photos of the men and red arrow hats, but I'm, I, I'm not, and that's fascinating, but I am familiar with one thing. One thing you can still experience in New Guinea um, is the, the, the war is ever present. Um, because they're a storytelling culture and because for the most part, they don't have TV and they have no other sources of entertainment, they, they, they still tell war stories today. And little kids, little kids will tell you the story, stories that they've heard from their grandfathers of these men marching through their villages. And it's really an extraordinary thing to see that that still live and, and still be um, a, 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 re, a substantial part of their identity. And um, so, so I'm aware of that, but no, I'm not aware of the the tribal oak. I am aware, I think what you're referring to maybe is um, something called cargo cults. It just struck me. So the cargo cults that spread out, that, that spread all over New Guinea after World War II is that they, they, they saw all of a sudden these virtually Stone Age people saw the modern world and they couldn't believe it. So they thought these planes were delivering gods from the sky. And they saw, they saw um, things hooked up to generators. So what they did is they would take these bush vines and they would construct something, say, that, that looked like a, a refrigerator and they would expect it to cool their food. But they, they, were, they were unable to make these huge leaps because, of course, nothing in their imaginations or nothing in their experience had ever prepared them for this you know, for the assault of the modern world. And it was, you can imagine it was mind boggling for them. But cargo cults continued to spread, well, not today, but for decades after sprang up all over the island. Uh, looks like we have uh, two questions from Kevin. I'll give them to you one at a time. The first one is, what was the size of the Japanese force? Enormous. Um, seven, tw uh, 18,000 men, 18,000 men on the, uh, committed to the battle. Well, eventually, the, the, the sea, the um, attack on Port Moresby, they eventually retreated. And then the defense of, of, the, of the Papuan Peninsula, 18,000 troops. And Kevin's second question is, how long did it take before reinforcements arrived? For the US, for the US troops. Um, I'm assuming. I'm assuming. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, the 41st Division was brought in, I think, in December and 163rd in January. So the men had been fighting for the 32nd Division, um, had been fighting. And they didn't have the whole division there initially, but they'd been fighting for a month and a half with the Australians to the north before reinforcements arrived. 
And we have a question from Avery now. These men were immersed in the wilderness and were fighting for survival for a long period of time. How did that impact their life and view of the modern world? Oh, man. Um, the men who made, many of the men who made it back, um, well, first of all, when they, when I told them that I went to New Guinea for fun or for an adventure, a young man's adventure, they thought I was stark raving mad and understandably, but um, many of the men never wanted to sleep outside again. They never wanted to camp. They never wanted to pick up a rifle. Um, I think it had a pretty profound effect on, on how some of them conducted their lives. Um, yeah, it's hard, it's, hard, it's hard to forget those things. And many of them had malaria attacks long after they came home. Hmm. So is, is malaria, and I apologize for my ignorance, is, is malaria still uncurable today? Well, um, that's a good question. Yeah, there's still lots of Papua New Guineans who are dying from malaria. Um, and so what, what it does is, is it embeds itself in the liver. And if you don't kill um, that, um, forget it, what it is, that embeds itself in the liver, malaria will continue to recur. And that's what happened to a lot of the men. They were getting malaria, malarial attacks 20 years after they'd, after they'd left New Guinea. But it is absolutely a killer. Um, um, my wife, when she had malaria, I, when I had malaria, I didn't have it as bad as she did, but she had 104.5 degree fever for over two weeks. Mm -hmm. And we, we were, you know, pretty much on an isolated island um, with only one doctor on the island. Wow. Yeah. Uh, here's a great comment. My name is Mark Holman and I am Major Warman Helvin's grandson. <laughs> And thanks for putting this together tonight. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you for coming. That's good to hear. It looks like we might have a couple. Uh, here's one from uh, Kevin. Thanks you for the answer to his two part question. And then uh, Janice says, how many ghost boys were there and how many of them lost their lives in uh, New Guinea? Well, there were about, let's see. Um, well, I would say there are about 1,100 of them. And um, I don't know what the, how many of them died on the island, but I do know, as I mentioned before, that the, particularly the second battalion of the 126th Infantry Regiment, um, by the end of the battle for Buna, um, ceased to exist. I mean, the, it, many of the men died, many of the men were so sick that they were eventually sent back to the United States. But um, out of the 10,000 men committed to the island of New Guinea, I think casualty rates were pushing nearly 80%. And again, that does, that, that does include you know, tropical diseases. And, and you said, with, were the Japanese experiencing sort of the same rates or even worse or? Yeah, um, 13,500 Japanese lost their lives mm. or 14,000 um, in the Battle of Buna. And then some, some escaped you know, by, by ship okay. or fled into the jungles and were discovered you know, 20 years later, still thinking that the war was going on. Hmm. Wow. So Mr. Uh, Oosterhart has another question for us. Uh, were the Japanese forces facing the sea? And if so, did that aid in the Americans' victory as they were coming from inland? No, no they were facing inland. Their backs were to the sea. And they, they had occupied all the high ground along on the coast, and we were we were um, which left only the swamps for the men who were trying to unseat the Japanese. So um, it was a pretty miserable situation. Uh, but no, their backs were to the sea, and obviously, had we had destroyers off the coast, 
shelling their positions, it would have been a very different battle. Um, but we didn't have that. Uh, Jared has a question. How did the US soldiers you interviewed view their Japanese adversaries and their willingness to do things like bonsai charges? Well, I think that um, the, I think they, they viewed, well, they were, of course, um, you know, demonized as, as, as barbarians and they committed lots of barbaric acts. There's absolutely no question about that, as George said, in the rape of Nanking, but, and they committed terrible acts on the island of New Guinea. Um, but, uh, and I, I think, I think that what I learned from reading the Jap Japanese diaries, and this doesn't exactly answer your question, and I apologize for that, but they, in many ways, they were, they were normal men, just like, just like our Red Arrow men. They were, you know, they had, they left behind mothers and fathers and, and children, and they wanted, they wanted to survive, but um, they had, they had a, um, um, a fighting desire that was that was burned and in, entrained into them, but I think that that the soldiers, um, well, we didn't take a lot of prisoners. I guess put it that way. Very very interesting. I'd like to say one other thing. I don't know if please. Um, yeah, I'd mentioned um, so. That we, we've started a we've started a GoFundMe campaign, and forgive the solicitation, but we started a GoFundMe campaign that um, it, it's um, run. Well, was administered or begun by my daughter Rachel Campbell, um, and you can find it on Google. We're trying to we're trying to provide the communities along the the um, Kappa Kappa Trail with uh, medical supplies which they desperately need. And we're trying to encourage them also to keep history alive, World War II history alive on the Kappa Kappa Trail. So if anybody is moved, um, it would like to see that. Go, Google, um, go, you know, go fund me, Rachel Campbell or the Ghost Mountain Trail and you'll find the fun. But um, Donna Wilson, who's also from Muskegon and maybe in the audience can certainly tell you about this. Donna and I hiked. Donna was Carl, Carl Stenberg's granddaughter, and she, she, um, I was part of a group that she was part of, and my daughter in 2018, and we hiked um, from Gaba Gaba to Buna on the entire trail. So, um, if anybody's interested, Donna can certainly tell you about that too. Thank you. Very, very interesting. I, I did find it interesting, uh, uh, you know, how many of uh, the the villagers were. Uh, got involved and how supportive they were, and that was yeah. a very well, interesting not, aspect. Yeah, not only not only for for the soldiers, and as I said, it would have been impossible for the soldiers to get across the mountains without the carriers and the scouts, but also for us. Um, when when I went over there in 2005 and 2006, and again in 2018. These villagers are along the trail. Along the trail, are so happy to keep this history alive, and they're doing, in many cases, a remarkable job. And I, not only as storytellers, but also trying to preserve parts of plains or canteens or what or or dog tags or whatever they can, and also telling the stories about you know that have been passed down about seeing the soldiers come through their villages. It's really, as I said, a, a really remarkable thing. And James, if they want to find a link to that too, they can look on my Facebook page too. Uh, just oh, that's yeah. Thank you very I, much I, for that, George. I great, George. The thank you. Information in there. So, and we have to remember, we live in a world of opulence in comparison to many people in, in the rest of the world. A simple aspirin looks rather large in a third world, folks. A bandage looks very large. That's exactly right. Don't have them. So, uh, and a little bit of money, uh, your lunch money can make a big difference <laughs> to somebody. So I commend Rachel and 
and others who are, who are taking this on. It's a real good cause. So, James, it has been a heck of a oh. I mean, I think we enjoy your presence. Well, thank you always, so much. You know, always, you're like a native son to us here in Muskegon for more than one reason. And uh, we want to continue to encourage you. And, you know, someday you got to tell us the story behind uh, being a reality uh, program producer <laughs> about the last Alaskans and your, your oh. life above the Arctic Circle with your uh, cousin. I'd love to. Uh, well, I appreciate, like I, appreciate too. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about the Ghost Mountain Boys. It's been a long, long time since I've done that. And I always welcome it. It's always... It's always difficult, but it's always a pleasure. And um, so I thank you very much for you know making this opportunity, uh, for give, allowing me this opportunity. Well, we thank you all again, you George and you James for making tonight's uh, event happen. It's a very special evening. Um, and, and very again, thanks to our sponsors, the uh, Silver Sides uh, Museum and, and the USS LST 393 Veterans Museum. We, couldn't have done this program without you. And it's just great to have everybody come together, particularly as we're trying to make virtual programming happen in this in our current situation in the pandemic world. So really, really appreciate. I want to remind our participants that um, we will, we did record tonight's presentation and we will have it on uh, the Muskegon Area District Library's YouTube channel by November 30th. It takes us a couple of days to get it up there and everything. And we got, uh, got Thanksgiving coming up. But thanks to everyone very much for attending. It's always our pleasure to remember World War II um, and the incredible individuals who uh, made the ultimate sacrifice or just were the incredible greatest generation who, who, did, who did the impossible, really. And uh, so, so fascinating and interesting to hear about it. Thank I just you. wanted to remind everybody real quickly, the, sign off for my library here is that the Muskegon Area District Library serves the community with 10 branches and we're open 24 seven during this pandemic time with our uh, access to many of our digital resources. And uh, again, thank you all so much for this evening. Thank you and thank you all for attending. I really appreciate it. Good night all. George, Good night all. Thanks a lot.